Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? I know people are sort of filing in and it's a little strange to be up here on the big screen <laughs> in this room. Um, but uh, welcome back. And uh, it's very nice to be joining you all and getting a chance to hear uh, some very interesting presentations. Uh, my name is Pam Bellock. I'm a health and science writer for the New York Times. And um, among the subjects I cover are neuroscience and neurological disorders uh, like Alzheimer's, ALS. And these are such serious and you know, significant diseases, of course, that touch so many patients and families and caregivers. And there's a widespread sense that it's just critical for scientists to find effective clinical approaches and therapies and ultimately, hopefully, uh, figure out ways to prevent these disorders. And of course, uh, getting a better understanding of what happens when things go wrong in the brain also helps shed light on how healthy brains function. So in this session, uh, we're gonna hear about some promising research related to brain disease and brain health. Our first speaker is Benjamin Auerbach of the University of Illinois. His talk is titled, Bridging the Gap from Genes to Behavior in Autism Spectrum Disorders. And he will be introduced by his former Pickauer mentor, uh, Pickauer professor, Mark Baer. Thank, thank you, Pam. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so uh, I joined the faculty at MIT at um, the moment of the creation of the Pickauer uh, Institute for Learning and Memory 20 years ago. So this is uh, my anniversary as well um, at MIT. But over my career, which is pretty long now, um, I've had the, the honor of, of training a, a large number of students. I think we're up to 29 and counting uh, at this point. And I think um, we would all agree that one of the most satisfying um, aspects of this career is this opportunity to train and mentor graduate students and postdocs and help them to launch their careers. And um, as, as Ellie mentioned earlier, um, you know, they, they go out into the world, they do amazing things. Um, our influence, we feel, has been amplified, you know, geometrically by what they do. And of course, we all, we take pride in, in what they have accomplished. Um, but, you know, um, I've had the opportunity to reflect on this a little bit more. And, you know, um, when I say the, the emotion pride really implies in a way that I'm taking some credit for what they've done. Um, I'm proud that I created this great scientist, right? But, but the reality is, the reality is, the, the, the better emotion is actually gratitude, which is how lucky we have been to have these brilliant people come through our labs. I mean, wow. And of course, MIT is, is um, there's no better place on earth um, to attract great students. And so, you know, what a blessing. And a case in point is, uh, is Ben. Ben um, was a graduate student in my lab um, in the early noughts, I guess we say. Um, and he came in an auspicious moment where, um, you know, we're really basic scientists. We're trying to understand how synapses are modified by experience, but we stumbled on to something unexpectedly um, that suggested the potential therapeutic for a um, severe neur neurological disease called Fragile X Syndrome. And uh, Ben made some very important contributions to the work uh, that was going on in the lab, and then it's gone on to extend this in ways that I, I never would have uh, imagined. So, Ben, take it away. Okay, everybody, everybody hear me? Thanks, Mark, for that very generous, overly generous introduction. Uh, it's, and thanks for the invitation and the organizers for allowing me to, to come today. Uh, uh, it's great to be back here and see a lot of, a lot of old faces, a lot of new faces. And you know, hear about all the amazing work that's been going on uh, over the past two decades here. And, and what I want to talk to you about today is you know, a topic that I really started to become interested in, as Mark alluded to, when I first came here as a grad student, and something that continues to be one of the major focuses of my own research uh, to this day. And, and, and you'll see how the work I did here really has influenced the way I think about things. Uh, and that's uh, identifying uh, the, the neural mechanisms associated with, with autism spectrum disorders. And so I'm sure everyone here is, is pretty familiar with, with autism, what it is. It's a, one of the most common neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, characterized by typical social behavior and communication. Uh, current rates suggest that every one in every 44 uh, children in the US are diagnosed with ASD. Uh, it's, 
it's a spectrum, meaning that there's a tremendous amount of variability uh, in disease symptoms uh, across the population. There are some folks diagnosed with ASD that have very great quality of life and wouldn't want anything to change. But uh, for many, many people, ASD uh, significantly impacts daily functioning and quality of life. And it can be a tremendous burden, not only to the individual, but uh, to family members and caretakers as well. So there really is a, a very high uh, societal economic cost associated with the disorder. And there's progress being made in terms of both behavioral and, and pharmacological interventions to help manage ASD symptoms. Uh, uh, but the, at the point, there's, there's really no cure for autism at this point, right? Um, uh, 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 there's no treatments directed at the core disturbances of the disorder. And that's due in large part to the fact that we have an incomplete understanding of its underlying mechanisms. And this is complicated uh, by, the, by the complexity uh, and really the, the heterogeneity of ASD and both its underlying causes and, and its phenotypic or, or clinical expression. Uh, and so we know autism is a highly heritable disorder. There's a very strong genetic component. Up to 80% of ASD cases can be accounted for by genetic risk factors. But what's emerging is this extremely complex genetic landscape. So this, this graph over here shows you just the sheer number of genes that have been implicated in, in ASD uh, pathogenesis. Uh, over hundreds and hundreds, maybe over a thousand genes now uh, have been indicated as significant risk, risk factors for the development of the disorder. <laughs> Uh, and at the same time, you have this very complex and heterogeneous uh, symptom profile as well, in that there are many behavioral domains disrupted in, in autism. And this includes these core domains of social uh, and behavior, communication, and stereotyped and restricted interests, but it also includes things like intellectual disability, uh, seizure disorders, sensory and motor abnormalities, and, and many others. And so really, you know, the, the challenge is how do we deal with and uh, really decompose this multi-level heterogeneity, right? How do we get from point A here to point B, and you know, how many different pathways are there, right? Uh, one of the major fundamental questions in the field is, you know, when we talk about autism, should we be, be considering this as a group of mechanistically distinct disorders that kind of happen to have an overlapping clinical presentation? Or do these various gene mutations uh, converge on, sh on, on shared mechanisms, you know, common biological processes, neuronal, or biological pathways, neuronal processes, uh, that can ultimately account for this constellation of phenotypes? that define the disorder. Uh, you know, so in other words, is there a, uh, a pathophysiological bottleneck, so to speak? And if so, what does this look like and at what level of neural function does it, does it occur? And, and this is the kind of the overarching question, one of the overarching questions that, that we're trying to understand and many researchers are trying to understand. And there's many approaches to take to this. And the way we do it is to look at animal models of autism that allow us to uh, interrogate in detail across these different levels of, of neuronal function. Uh, uh, but that starts with being able to adequately model uh, a complex disorder in animals. Uh, ideally, you want, you, want an animal, you want a model that has strong construct validity, meaning there's shared etiology with the human disorder, in this case, uh, you know, uh, highly penetrant genetic mutations that are associated with autism or, or high impact genetic risk factors. Uh, and ideally, you want uh, a model that has uh, face validity as well, where uh, you can see behavioral symptoms in these animals that, that it can correlate to the human condition, human clinical symptoms. Right, and so what I'll tell you about today are kind of two approaches that we've been taking. Uh, the, the, the first, I'll tell you a little bit about work that I did here uh, as a grad student in, in the Bear Lab, which kind of took a bottom-up approach to this question, comparing distinct uh, ASD-related mutations and seeing if they result in similar changes at the synaptic and cellular level. And then I'll tell you about more recent work that we're doing, which takes more of a top-down approach. We're developing novel behavioral assays for uh, ASD-related sensory sy symptoms and trying to map them onto their underlying neural circuit correlates. Um, and you know, ultimately, the goal is to combine these approaches and really fully bridge this gap between genes and behavior. All right, so first, uh, first question we, we asked was, is synaptic dysfunction one of these potential disease convergence points in, in autism? And, and, and the reason uh, this, is, this is a lot, because if you look at many of the gene, genetic mutations, that are associated with, with autism, a lot of them normally function or are normally involved in the formation and function of, of synapses. These are the connections between neurons that allow neurons to com communicate to each other. Uh, and particularly in the activity dependent regulation of synaptic strength or synaptic plasticity, which you heard a lot about uh, in the last session, how important that is for, for normal brain function. So we wanted to test this idea by directly comparing synaptic disturbances in uh, two of the most common uh, inherited causes of autism. Uh, uh, fragile X syndrome and, and tuberous sclerosis complex. And, and Mergahake Mer Mer gave a nice uh, introduction to this idea of these, these syndromic forms of autism. These are you know, single gene disorders that have very high rates, that are uh, relatively rare themselves, but have very high rates of autism. So they're highly penetrant ASD mutations. Uh, and fragile X and TSC uh, together account for about five to 10% of the total autistic population. Uh, and, and the important thing is that we know exactly the genetic mutations that cause these disorders. All right, we know that TSC is caused by heterozygous mutations in the TSC1 or 2 gene, and fragile X is caused by uh, the transcriptional silencing of the fmr one gene. 
And so we have very well validated genetic uh, animal models of these disorders. Uh, and, and the other interesting thing about these two uh, syndromes, not only are they the two leading inherited causes of autism, uh, but they happen to lie on a shared molecular pathway as well that, that couples synaptic receptors to neuronal protein synthesis. And, and they seem to be particularly important for regulating activity-dependent protein synthesis localized uh, in dendrites near synapses that are important for these long-term changes in, in, in synaptic strength. And, and so loss of function of the FMRP protein in Fragile X syndrome or the TSE1-2 complex in uh, tuberous sclerosis would be predicted to lead to similar, similar cellular consequences. Namely, you'd get increased rates of protein synthesis that's decoupled from uh, synaptic activity and this dysregulated, exaggerated, or dysregulated synaptic plasticity. Right, so, uh, so we thought when we tested these animals, if we looked at synaptic plasticity and protein synthesis, in these two uh, uh, mouse models of these two disorders, but we'd see the same uh, synaptic impairments. And it turns out we were completely wrong. Uh, what we actually saw was that these animals had exactly opposite phenotypes. While we had uh, increased uh, synaptic plasticity and protein synthesis in the fragile X animals, we actually saw a deficient synaptic plasticity and, and protein synthesis in, in, the, in the TSC animals. And, and moreover, they, they responded to the opposite modulation of the same uh, synaptic receptor, the temperature of glutamate receptor 5 or mglur 5 If you reduce mglur 5 activity in fragile X background, you can normalize these synaptic and cellular phenotypes. And if you increased the temperature of glutamate receptor activity in the TSE background, you could normalize those synaptic and cellular phenotypes. So, right, so we were completely wrong, but it, the way I like to think about it is we were so wrong, it's almost like we were right. And, and what, what I mean by that is, <laughs> is that, it, you know, it, it does seem that dysregulated synaptic plastic or synaptic protein synthesis may be one of these convergence points, but you can have bidirectional changes in this process, right? And maybe it's not so much the direction of the change, but, but the fact that it's been pushed outside of this optimal range, right? And so maybe this is a failure of synaptic homeostasis and that deviations in either way are gonna impair cognitive performance. Um, and so they're really to kind of, uh, to drive that point home, we wondered, uh, could these mutations actually balance each other at the synaptic or, or, and or behavioral level? And indeed, that appears to be the case when we crossed our fragile X animals, with TSC animals, to, to, lead, to give us litter mates that were either had no mutations, had just the fMR1 mutation, just the TSC2 mutation, or, or, or the double mutants out of both. What we saw is again, we see this bi directional change in synaptic plasticity in, in the single mutants, and that was completely restored to normal levels in the double mutants. So they indeed seem to balance each other at the synaptic level. Uh, and and even, even more interestingly, when we looked at a, a, a memory impairment in these animals, this is a, a context discrimination fear conditioning assay where Animals, uh, uh, you would be paired in a versus foot shock with a particular context. This, is, this is, involves the hippocampus. And then you, you put them back in either a similar context or a novel context. They can uh, tell you how, how much they made that association by the stereotype freezing response. And we saw in both the single mutants that they, they, they could indeed form this association, but they tended to generalize their fear that they, they would freeze in this novel context as well as the, as well as the familiar, familiar one, unlike wild type animals. So they had actually a, a shared memory impairment that once again, was reversed uh, uh, in, in these double mutants. And so the, really the thing that stuck with me from this study was how do we have these opposite changes in, in, in hippocampal synaptic function lead to uh, 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 the, the same behavioral manifestation of, of hippocampal impairment, right? Uh, and, and what that made me think uh, in particular is that maybe uh, one of the things we need to be looking at more is, is at this at the circuit level. Maybe this is the circuit level is where this convergence might be happening. And you have these changes in synaptic function that ultimately, how do they ultimately end up changing the, the connectivity of neurons, how they inform, process information in, in a way that's ultimately going to, going to lead to the uh, behavioral phenotypes of, of, of autism. And, and so we wanted to do this in a way where we could kind of explicitly connect these circuit dysfunction to, to behavioral symptoms of the, of the disorder, which is not trivial because many of the, the, the core ASD symptoms are uh, very complex uh, and, uh, and uh, rely on you know, distributed brain circuits that are incompletely understood. And so the way we, we did this is approach it through a lens of sensory processing deficits in autism. And, and we did this for a couple of reasons. First, the, this is a very important and common clinical issue in, in autism. Uh, it's a nearly, a, a sensory deficits are nearly universally seen in ASD individuals, upwards of 95% of patients. And uh, it, it, it comes in many forms. It's heterogeneous like, like most phenotypes in ASD, but sensory uh, hyperactivity or sensory over, hypersensitivity or overreactivity uh, seems to be a very common one, this idea of sensory overload. Uh, and often one of the most debilitating sensory phenotypes uh, that's likely to directly contribute to social and communicative impairments, right? If we cannot process incoming sensory input in the same way, that's gonna lead to our differences in how we interact with our environment. So there's a lot of uh, good you know, re reasons to specifically looking uh, at sensory issues in autism from, from a clinical perspective. And at the same time, sensory systems also afford a, a, a tractable model uh, 
for, for understanding neural circuit and AST mechanisms uh, more, more generally, right? Because these are very well studied systems. Uh, they have well characterized neural anatomy that's relatively well conserved across evolution. And you have very precise uh, control of stimulus input, right? You can manipulate a sensory environment uh, experimentally in a very precise way. Uh, and as really, we think we also have some very nice readouts of sensory processing, both, both behavioral and, and, and neurophysiological. Another reason is that uh, uh, this is also a, another area of interest in our lab, coming from my postdoctoral work, looking at the central auditory system and, and how that responds to, to the changes in, in auditory input, such as noise induced hearing loss. And so we, we had spent uh, a lot of time trying to develop behavioral measures of sound sensitivity in, in rodent models, in this case, in, in rat models in, in, instead of mouse models. And so we have a, a multiple behavioral tests that, that we, we use. Uh, uh, some are based on this uh, operant conditioning paradigm, similar to what uh, Mergaka showed in the visual system, where we can train these rats to report the detection of a sound uh, by poking their nose in a, in a nose poke hole in, in response to a food reward. And then uh, using this task, we can measure a, a few different, uh, different aspects of sensory sensitivity or auditory sensitivity. Uh, we can measure their, their detection thresholds, right? How, what's the lowest intensity sound they can reliably respond to. And this is essentially the exact same way this is done in the hearing clinic. If you go get a hearing test, you, you put the headphones on and you raise your hand when you, you hear a sound. Uh, the only difference is you don't get a food reward like, like, like the rats do. Uh, so it's very clinically translatable. Uh, and, and we also showed under the right conditions that we can use the reaction time uh, to, to the stimulus. So how fast they respond following a sound presentation as a measure of, of loudness growth. So you see as you increase sound intensity, you see this predictable decrease in reaction time. And we've done a lot of controls to validate this, this reaction time assay, and it really follows all the psychoacoustic rules of loudness perception that you would, you would like. So we think this is a reliable objective measure of, of something that's inherently a subjective aspect of perception. And, and then finally, we have a, we've developed a novel a sound avoidance task. Uh, which is very different in nature, but provides pretty complementary information. So this is an assay where, uh, uh, based on animals' uh, natural preference for this dark enclosed area, as opposed to a bright open one being nocturnal burrowing creatures, that makes sense. The, under normal conditions, they greatly prefer to stay in this dark arena. But when we start introducing sounds in that dark arena, we can see this change in preference as a function of sound intensity. So as the sound level is increased, in here, the animals are actively avoided by moving into this innately aversive bright arena. So we think this is more of a measure, less a measure of the perceptual attributes of the sound, but more the effective response to them, how aversive or unpleasant those sounds are, which I think is important when considering what's known about sensory deficits in, in, in autism, right? And so now what we can do is we can use these, and we've, we've validated all these tasks with normal hearing animals and as well as hearing loss models. And now what, what we're doing now is applying these tasks to uh, rodent models of, of autism. And, and we started with Fragile X syndrome based on our previous work, uh, as well as the fact that auditory hypersensitivity seems to be particularly present, prevalent in, in this form of ASD. And indeed, we see uh, behavioral uh, differences in, in uh, ephem this is now an ephemeral knockout rat model of Fragile X syndrome that, 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 that correspond with what we see uh, uh, in the clinical condition as well. And so first, the, these animals can learn and do these tasks at the same level as their wild type counterparts. Uh, but what we saw, we don't see any difference in their, in, their, in their detection thresholds or their hearing thresholds. But what we do see is that they have these abnormally fast reaction times, which we think is indicative of increased loudness perception. And we've done a lot of uh, controls to really convince yourself that this reaction time difference is really perceptual in nature and not a, a motor impairment or something like that. Uh, and then we also see this exaggerated avoidance behavior where uh, these, these rats are being driven out of that, that preferred dark box uh, to a greater degree than wild type animals. Uh, even at the same intensity sound. So we think this means uh, they have this increased sound aversion as well, right? So we have these, both the perceptual attributes and the effective response to sound uh, appear to be altered in, in these animals, which uh, corresponds very well with, with, with auditory hypersensitivity seen in fragile X individuals, All right? So now we, we kind of have these bookends now. We have some well-validated animal models. We think we have some pretty nice behavioral measures of, of the sensory deficits in these disorders. And, and what we're currently doing now is, uh, is filling in these gaps, right? Using the multiple levels of analysis, uh, looking at how loss of fMR1 or mutation uh, affects the, the auditory networks involved using uh, sound evoked functional imaging, the local microcircuit changes using in vivo electrophysiology with cell type specific manipulations, uh, uh, the synaptic and cellular changes uh, in the ex vivo slice recording, as well as the changes in gene and, and, and protein expression uh, as well. And so, you know, if I had all the answers for this today, I wouldn't have spent 
14 minutes of a 15 minute talk uh, setting up this slide. Uh, but I do want to tell you just uh, a, a few examples of the progress that, that we're making on, on this front. And so one of the first things you wanted to do is figure out well, you know, which parts of the auditory system might be involved in the sound hypersensitivity. Because sound information travels through a number of different brain regions. And a number of regions are important for different aspects of sound perception. And we started with this kind of classical ascending auditory pathway. And we did targeted electrophysiological recordings uh, in, in vivo uh, from these different structures in the same animals to look at uh, sound intensity coding at different levels of the auditory system. And, and what we see is that while these fragile X animals have normal uh, evoked responses in the, in the subcortical structures in the auditory brainstem and midbrain, we see this evidence for sound evoked hyperactivity in, in, in the primary auditory cortex. And this was associated also with changes in neural synchronization and, and neural oscillations as uh, Earl talked about earlier, uh, this idea of kind of bottom up, top down, uh, interactions being, being altered. Uh, so this sound evoked hyperactivity could certainly be related to their sound hypersensitivity. Uh, we want to look a little closer at what's going on in the auditory cortex. So we've been doing uh, these whole cell patch camp recordings to look at the, uh, the changes in, in synaptic, uh, synaptic strength on, on auditory cortical principal cells. And what we see is we don't see any change in excitatory synaptic currents, but we see this reduction in inhibitory synaptic currents. So we've kind of had this change in the balance between excitation and inhibition, which is another common uh, suggestion of a convergence point uh, in ASD. And so in this case, we have the shift to that would promote excitatory over inhibitory strength and lead to this kind of hyper excitability in the cortex, which could uh, underlie the sound evoked hyperactivity as well. And indeed, if we tried to rebalance the, uh, the excitation inhibition by uh, chemogenetically increasing the activity of cortical inhibitory neurons, in the auditory cortex, we can actually uh, renormalize the, the, these reaction time differences in these animals, showing that this cortical disinhibition or cortical hyperexcitability uh, it, it definitely certainly contributes to the sound hypersensitivity. Um, right? And like I said, this EI balance is another one of these potential bidirectional axes that can be altered in ASD. And, and there's certainly a, a lot more uh, to, to figure out uh, in, in this regard, you know, you know, particularly the, the, the layer and cell type specific changes in the cortex uh, and how they relate to loss of, of fMRP function. Uh, uh, we also are, so we're zooming in on the cortex, but we're also zooming out. Uh, we've had some interesting results from our imaging studies where it's, we can kind of replicate this cortical hyperactivity, but we also see a lot of brain networks that uh, are, are differentially uh, engaged in sound processing in fragile X animals uh, that probably we, we wouldn't have thought to look at otherwise. So now we're doing more uh, targeted uh, examination of these of these other areas as well uh, to kind of get at the broader auditory network I involved in these sound deficits. Uh, and then finally, the adult, the, the you know the long term goal is once we have this established uh, in in our fragile X model is to apply this to to different models, uh, genetic models of autism, to try to figure out where we can find these convergence or divergence in, in disease mechanisms at these different levels of neural function, how they interact across these levels. Uh, and hopefully we can better define autism. Maybe we can define these ASD subtypes as uh, uh, continuous variations on a few uh, set of common axes, or perhaps it can be something more complex where you have these categorically distinct subgroups that have uh, some overlapping mechanism, but ultimately distinct mechanisms at their core. And I think in either way, that's gonna be really important for our understanding of the disorder uh, and, and diagnosis and treatment of autism. And so with that, I just wanna thank uh, all the members of my lab that's been involved. Obviously, uh, uh, the, the, the Bear Lab, and there's too many members to, to list here that were, were tremendously helpful in development of these ideas. Uh, my postdoctoral advisor lab, where we developed those um, uh, uh, sound sensitivity assays, as well as our collaborators and uh, funding agencies. And I'm happy to take any questions if I've left enough time. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Um, that, was really, that was really interesting. Um, I, uh, I don't see any questions coming in on online. I do see some hands raised. Does somebody, I can't moderate from there, so <laughs> sure. if you guys want to yeah. um, uh, you know, field the questions there yourselves. Um, sure. Maybe Ben, if you can repeat the question, that'd be great. Sure, yeah, the question was that you know, seizures are a common uh, uh, deficit in, in ASD, and have we looked at seizures in, in these animals? That, is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And 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 that's a in uh, so fragile X animals have a very well characterized seizure phenotype. These audiogenic seizures actually, where loud sounds cause them to, to go into into seizures. Uh, and that's there's a lot of work on understanding uh, how that works, and it's been used uh, often as a as a as a, as a screening tool. Uh, I would say there is there's some. Um, 
I have some reservations about that because these autogenic seizures seem to rely on a fairly restricted brain circuit that, that involves them and uh, it doesn't capture the, the sensory hypersensitivity uh, phenotype, I think, I think fully. So I think some of these more cognitive tasks uh, may be uh, uh, more beneficial and particularly because, because of the more complexity of the task, it also allows you to look for uh, side effects as well. So we've actually shown that we can rescue this uh, reaction time difference in these animals using the uh, MGLR5 inhibitor that's repeatedly been shown to be, have a, a lot of use in, in, uh, in Fragile X, but um, it also leads to these dose limiting side effects. We see that it, the, important, the performance in this task gets impaired in both wild type and Fragile X animals at high doses, and, and that might limit some of its clinical utility. So I think these, these kind of more uh, cognitive assays might uh, help in preclinical pre drug screening to, 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 to weed out some potential side effects as well. Yeah. Sure, yeah. The, the question was, the, is there changes in, in cortical os oscillatory activity in auditory cortex? And that's actually been well characterized already in both, both human EEG studies and, and in the mouse models, where you see uh, increased high-frequency gamma oscillations, uh, at least resting gamma oscillations, and uh, I think decreases in the, in the theta and maybe, maybe beta range. Uh, and we basically see the same thing in our, in our rat model. So that seems to be a really uh, uh, conserved uh, biomarker that could be potentially useful. And, and what we're trying to figure out now is how those oscillation changes actually correlate with changes in perceptual and sound perception. All right. Um, well, thank Wait, you so much. We have much. time for one, one more question. Oh, one more? Is Sorry. there one more? Sorry. <laughs> Since I'm moderating myself here, so. You're moderating yourself. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Better than your moderator. <laughs> Additional knockouts of the FMR1 or TSC to see if there's a critical time period developmentally for the appearance of the ASD phenotype. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's a great question. Um, there, there certainly has been. Uh, uh, like the question was that does anybody use conditional knockouts to look at the critical time period for these symptoms? That's something we're we're looking at as well in in, in ways and uh, uh, certainly there seems to be some dynamic changes across levels of the auditory system uh, at different time points, developmental time points. And so it's, you know, all of our work has been in, in adult animals, but the next step is figuring out, you know, are there changes in the sensory uh, input during early development that might result in the brain being wired differently? And that's certainly a possibility. All right, uh, I don't right. see any more questions. Yeah, and if people have more questions, I think there'll be a break um, where you can uh, rush up to the speakers and corner them um, to ask some questions. Um, all right, and thank you for uh, uh, tolerating this uh, virtual moderation, uh, which is a, we'll have a few kinks to work out. Um, uh, thanks so much, Ben.